sermons online, and for those of you online, I will project all that I can so you can hear me as our sound system is down today. But just this week, I saw the film, I'm Not Ashamed. Have you heard of the film as of yet? You will, yeah, if you, you can look in the bulletin. Um, the film I'm Not Ashamed is about Rachel Joy Scott the first victim of Colum Columbine High, of the Columbine High shooters. It was a phenomenal movie that told the true story of Rachel in her own words that were written in extensive diaries, uh, and they recorded her own fake journey. Uh, really extensive in the sense of think and Frank. You know, where we can tell who the person was because of their thoughts written on paper long after the fact of uh, the horrors that she suffered. She was, Rachel that is, a person of profound faith. And actually so was Anne Frank, but, but Rachel's who I'm talking about today. She was a person of profound faith, but in the end, she was a person. She did not always do what was right. She made mistakes. She was often confused, afraid to be herself. And she wrestled with God and with her identity in God. She wrestled with her place in the world and with her very purpose for being in the world. There was a scene where a rather cynical student questions her on her faith. Whether she truly believed all of that Jesus freak stuff that she was seeming to believe, seemingly believing. And she looked up at him and responded, I take it you don't really like me, do you? He said, I can't stand what you stand for. All holier than thou, judging and looking down on everyone. That's not who I am, she replied. I just want to follow my Jesus and be a part of a chain reaction of positive change in this world. He was taken aback by that. And he responded, that's cool, I guess. You sound more like a Buddhist than a Christian. To which she replied, Perhaps you should get to know one. Rachel was not a person who judged others. Not even this boy, who she couldn't have been any more different than. And who was ironically judging her. I just love and, you know, I love it because I used to be a person who did it. I love when people say, oh, those hypocritical Christians, they judge everybody else, and they're no good for the world. My friends, is that not a judgment? Does that not make us stand as hypocrites when we are tossing judgment back at the ones we're blaming as judges? But she was not a person who judged others. But there is something to be said that what causes others to look at Christians as those who judge. We, often, we who see ourselves as Christian often see ourselves as being in with God. And we often judge others, especially those that we see as not being in with God. I have, uh, over the years, witnessed Christians doing many things under that vein. I've witnessed Christians outside of Marilyn Manson concerts judging all the people inside as being damned to hell for listening and part of my French. I think the kids left. But, with the exception of Maeve, hi Maeve. That was, you didn't hear that word. Earmuffs. Um, we, we, we judge, the, the people outside judging the people inside that concert as being uh, worth worthy of help for listening to Marilyn Manson. 
We judge people who take different political positions as being not truly Christian, not one of us. Just like the Pharisee who saw himself as the true Jew, unlike that wretched tax collector over there who's praying in the temple but robbing his people blind of all the money. And by the way, so you understand what a tax collector was. Tax collectors were a little different in Jesus' day than they are in our day. You see, they were Jewish people employed by the Roman Empire to collect taxes for Rome. And what these people would often do, because Rome didn't pay them a whole lot, what, what these people would often do is hike the taxes and, and pay the difference to themselves. So they were literally exploiting their own people for money. And this guy has the nerve to walk in the temple and stand next to me, a person who is here praying for justice and peace every day. This guy has the nerve to come in and stand next to me like he belongs here when he's living that horrible life outside of these walls. Doesn't sound unfair of a judgment, does it? We tend to look at the Pharisees as being hard-nosed and, and legalistic. But honestly, honestly, think of the worst people in our communities. If they were to come in here and start praising God, what would our attitude be toward them? And this is evidence that we judge is evidenced by the perception that people have of Christians. Is it not? Did they, did that, that uh, notion of Christians judging come out of thin air? Like one day they woke up and go, oh, those Christians, you know, out of nowhere? Or is it because in their lives they've experienced that judgment? Or they've seen others who have? That's partly why the world looks at us with scorn and disdain. That's not only why it does, but that is partly why it does. Because of the perception that we think we're better than everyone else. That we're the judges. Now, we cannot change that perception. We can go out on the street and not judge. I mean, Rachel Joy Scott's a perfect example. She was somebody who didn't judge in practice, treated everybody equally, and yet people still have that perception of her. It's impossible for us to eliminate that perception. And we can't force people to see who we are. People will believe what they choose to believe. And they have different reasons for believing it. Perhaps coming to church and being a part of faith holds them too much accountable to them, to, 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 to their, holds their lifestyles and themselves too much accountable for them to feel comfortable here. Perhaps it causes them to give more of themselves than they would otherwise be comfortable to give. People will choose to believe what they believe as they choose to believe it, for a whole wide variety of different reasons, outside of our control, whether we give them a reason to believe it or not. But we are called to change ourselves. We cannot change what other people do, but we are called to change ourselves, to open ourselves to our Jesus. I love that she said, my Jesus. We're called to open ourselves to our Jesus. To be a part of the chain reaction for positive and godly change that he started and continues to work in this world. We serve a Jesus who taught us to know our place in God's kingdom. And that place was not above or below anybody else. For in God's kingdom, all, even the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the murderers, all are equally loved. All are loved and are welcomed. Does not mean their sins are condoned, but they are loved. If we exalt ourselves, if we will be humble, Scripture says. But if we are humble, then in our humility, we will be exalted. It's a lot like the parable that Jesus taught about the guy who 
came in and sat at the head of the table because he thought he was so great. And Jesus pointed out to him, don't sit at the head of the table, for when the master comes and chooses to put somebody in your place, you'll be humiliated. How embarrassing. Sorry, sir. That, sir is not, that seat's not for you. You need to sit over here. But if we are humble and know who we are and whose we are and where we belong, then we will be exalted. Not just in the eyes of God, but in the lives of those around us. For they will know what true love is through God, who is displayed through our humility. Now, for those of us that know, and I think everybody here, almost everybody here, knows the story of Columbine High, and knows the story, at least on the surface, of Rachel Joy Scott, who was the first victim who was shot. I'm not giving anything away by what happened to her. Um, and I do highly recommend going to see the movie. But do you know that at the end, after she died, that very same kid who judged her was lamenting her loss and saying, that is truly what a Christian ought to be. That is truly what a Christian ought to be. She didn't force him to see her for who she was. She just showed him who she was. And let him change himself. And let God work in him for that change. Today, Luke was baptized. Not because he's loved more or less than anybody else. Not because he was... Uh, not because he is somehow now um, going to have a higher status or or be something that other people are not, or join some kind of exclusive club that only he and a few others can be a part of. God, if that's what Christianity is, let's just sleep in, close the doors, and watch Sunday Night Football, right? We can watch football all day long and have an exclusive club unto ourselves in our home. We don't need to come to church for that. Plenty of exclusive clubs out there in the world. He got baptized because he was created by God. Loved by God. In the same way that God loves all of us and all of creation. And because God has a purpose for him, for Luke, one that will continue on in the chain reaction that Christ started 2,000 years ago, the chain reaction of Christ is still sparking in this world today through people like Luke who will hopefully one day see Christ as his Lord and Savior and accept that for himself. Today, we acknowledge this, this is wisdom. To acknowledge this is wisdom. To live it, though, to acknowledge this is wisdom, but to live it and to bring others to acknowledge and live it is to live the godly way. That is what our call here is as the church. And if we're not doing that, then everything else is noise and circumstance. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, the famous marriage verse that was not about marriage at all. Um, Paul says, if I speak wonderfully with words that could convince the masses but have not love, I am but a climbing symbol. And the noisy dawn. If I could speak in ways and do things in ways that could move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. That is what we're called to do as a church. To be love. To be Christ in the community. Christ's body has risen from the dead. And Christ's body is not here on earth, but through us. Amen? Amen? We represent the resurrected body of Christ. We better not take that lightly. To take that seriously is to live the godly way. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you and praise you for this message which challenges us. Lord, give us a Rachel kind of faith. 
a faith that does wrestle, that does doubt, that does go through, through uh, the serious inquiries that, that faith should go through. But a faith in the end that says, here I am, Lord. Send me. A faith that in the end does spark 